Dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate Corpus Christi, and Jesus comes in a special way today and every Sunday and actually every day, actually 24 hours per day. He comes to you in the poverty of the Eucharist. He comes to you meek. He comes to you small. He comes to you in the shape of something absolutely in absolutely unimportant, insignificant, just a piece of bread, unleavened, the most basic kind of bread. It doesn't have cinnamon, it has, doesn't have anything on it. You know, it's interesting because if you think about it, Jesus could have said, I am going to remain with you in, you know, a huge mountain. And every time we want to celebrate Mass, we have to find a huge mountain which would be very difficult. He could have said, I am going to stay among you in this amazing, huge piece of gold. I'm, I'm going to be there present. And that would might, you know, might come to you, okay, this looks kind of important. It's got gems and it's got gold and it's got everything. And, you know, it seems like, okay, this is kind of godish. No? Or I'm going to come to you in, in any shape. Anything that would impress you more? What is less impressive than a piece of bread? So Jesus comes to you in the poverty of the Eucharist. He comes as a beggar. He comes knocking at the door of your heart, seeing and asking, is there any faith in there? Do you have the capacity to see what is invisible? Have you been able to reach a point in your life and in your faith where you can recognize and say in the bottom of your heart, God is there? And that definitely is a journey, and it's not an easy journey, dear brothers and sisters. I can tell you I was a cradle Catholic, but lapsed and fell away and all that stuff in my teen years. And it took me, I think, three really important steps to reach this point. So the first step that happened as I studied and read and started to understand things is start to read the signs of the divinity of Jesus. Little by little, not the proof, because Jesus didn't want proofs. There might be some, but not proof, but signs. Signs, it's something very interesting. It's something that's pointing towards something else, but it always has maybe a realm where you could doubt it. You know, so for example, a sign could be Jesus is walking over water, but you could say, oh, they made that up, or he had a lot of stones underneath holding him, or there were all these you know, Navy SEALs back 2,000 years ago, but they teletransported it. Whatever. Our brain is crazy how we can, like, mess up things. But it is a very powerful sign that says, hey, this guy is walking on water. Or this guy just resurrected Lazarus. Or this guy just multiplied bread and, and, blood, and, and fish for 5,000 people. Or this guy was dead, dead, completely dead, and now he's alive. And all of those things are signs that are pointing, and as you study them and you expose yourself to those signs, maybe little by little you can come to the conclusion that I came at one point, and I hope everybody here does as well, Jesus is God. You'll see that these three things are very basic, but them being basic doesn't mean that they're not hard to reach. Probably you all maybe give them for granted, who here doesn't believe that Jesus is, not, is God? Probably all of us. But did you think it out? Did you really say, Jesus is really God? The second thing that happened in my life, and hopefully as well in yours, is I recognized through the diverse Eucharistic miracles that truly Jesus is present in the Eucharist. That this piece of bread, this very simple piece of bread, and the, here I, bit, I used a bit more of my scientific background because I checked these miracles and read through the fine print and went through the whole thing that now I can't repeat it, obviously, because it happened like 40 years ago or 30 years ago. But 
I realized, oh my God, this is truly Jesus. In this humble, small piece of bread is the presence of God. And if you haven't reached that place, because actually if, you, if we poll Americans, uh, Catholic Americans, uh, we'll see that about 60% believe that the Eucharist is the real presence of Jesus. So maybe we'll have some of you who don't truly believe that the presence of Jesus is in that host. The Protestants don't, or a, a several of them, uh, but we definitely do. And there are all these Eucharistic miracles that happened all through the years. It's, there's so many Eucharistic miracles, and many of them have been scientifically studied. And obviously the scientists can't conclude anything because science doesn't allow you to say, but they say this is unexplicable. And that again is not proof, but it is a sign. When you start to read one and then again and again and again, you say, okay, there's something happening here. And at one point in my life, I said, I truly believe that Jesus, who is God, is present in the Eucharist. And one of the interesting things in these Eucharistic miracles is that when the host miraculously becomes flesh and they study it, and this is something that happened like 400 years ago or 600 years ago when they had no idea anybody would study this like 600 years later, what did they find in that piece of flesh? Dried up, all you want. Do you know what they found? human heart tissue. Now, who 600 years ago would go and do, oh, I'm going to, you know, kill this person, cut his heart, put it there, so that when 600 years later they study it, they find, figure out, okay, this is not a hoax because this is human heart tissue. It's more difficult to think of that than to believe the host is truly the heart of Jesus, the real presence of Jesus. So that's number two. Hopefully, we're all going through one, Jesus is God, two, the Eucharist is the true presence of God. And then the third one happened through retreats, through moments of prayer, through moments where I had time to stop in my crazy life, in my engineering crazy thing of like trying to do a ton of things. And, and little by little this happened when I realized that actually, God loves me. That it is personal. That he gave his life for me. I started to read different signs in my life, not proof again, different signs in my life that showed me little by little, oh, what a coincidence I called them at the beginning. And then I started to call them, oh, this is kind of like a God incidence. That's so funny, it happened again. And finally, I had to surrender to the fact that God loves me personally. And that is in the Catechism as well. You read it and you probably all repeated it a hundred times. We're going to repeat it here. God loves you. But it is different when you, through your faith journey, come to see what is invisible. That this piece of bread that is truly Jesus the Lord is here for you. He will die in the cross for you. He is willing to give his life for you. His love for you is infinite. And maybe if 60% were the ones that believe that the Eucharist is truly the presence of God, maybe I have no idea. We haven't done that survey or I haven't found it. And maybe we'll find that maybe 10 or 20% truly believe that Jesus did it for them personally, that God loves you personally, that is talking to you personally. So dear brothers and sisters, these three things I think are really important pieces of faith that allow us to see what is unseen through all of these signs to come here to do what we are supposed to do, which is true worship. Today, there, the Psalm 116 is one of my favorite ones. I remember it's one of the ones that was in my ordination, and it starts like this. Once you have these three experiences, we will come to this question. How shall I make a return to the Lord for all that good that he has done for me? How can I pay back God? 
if he died for me on the cross, if he's feeding me with his body and blood, if he's giving everything for me, how can I pay back? And the answer, dear brothers and sisters, absolutely impossible. You will never be able to beat God in love or even get to his same level. But the psalm suggests something very important. The cup of salvation I will take up and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will give him praise. I will thank him. I will worship him. And I hope, dear brothers and sisters, today, as I told you last Sunday, you can do one thing. Worship God. Jesus taught us, true worshipers are going to worship me in spirit and truth. It is those people who truly believe and those people who truly come here in their spirit and saying one thing, you are God. You are the best. I adore you. You see, dear brothers and sisters, when these three things come into your life, everything changes. Everything. We are dealing here not with a Sunday obligation. The obligation means absolutely nothing. Hell means nothing because you have God in front of you and a God who loves you. So that just radically changed everything. And that's what happened to the people who are in our stained glasses. What happened to them? They said, kill me. Take everything away from me. I Really, it's, it's junk compared to God. And of course, maybe you're still not stained glass window level. I'm not there. You know, if, if someone comes and wants to kill me, I'm going to be, oh, that's kind of hard. You know, <laughs> I like my life. Um, okay, you know, it would be really hard. I, I don't think I'm ready to be a martyr. Maybe 1% here is. You see, we went from 100 to 60 to 10 to maybe 0 0.5. And that's, that's the way it is. Not everybody will reach the stained glass. But we know the journey. And finally, one of the beautiful things that happens, and this is the fourth piece of truth that the psalm already starts to talk about, the next paragraph says, how much it weighs to the Lord the death of his faithful. There is an intimate connection. You know, sometimes in our broken world, in our divided world, people want to divide. Rad trads and social justice people. They want to divide. You know? or, or you start to put incense or you start to take care of the poor. And, and Jesus, what he teaches us in the Eucharist as that he is present in the Eucharist, but he also said in, in Matthew 30, uh, 25 that he is present in each one of us. God is present in the Eucharist, but God is also present right here. All of us are part of the body of Christ. So when we receive communion, what are we doing? The whole body of Christ is uniting in the Eucharist. Something beautiful, really, really beautiful happens when you receive communion. We are all intimately connected in Christ. Of course, that depends on the degree of our faith because you could be in mortal sin and not believe in anything and just chew it like bubble gum, which would be truly awful or in a state of mortal sin and, 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 and be really bad for you. You know, that's why we have confession. But if you are in a good state, reasonable state, and even if your faith is not perfect, what happens when you receive communion is we are all united. Therefore, the reverence with God in the Eucharist is translated in, into the reverence that we have for all people. In everybody, we see the presence of God, sometimes more bright, sometimes dimmer. So let us celebrate, let us worship. It's such a big deal. Ask the Lord as we are praying in a moment, ask him to make you grow in your faith, that you might believe that Jesus is God, that he is truly present in the Eucharist, and that he loves you. And finally, that he is present in every human being.